Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're very welcome to this evening's lecture, uh, which is a joint lecture between ourselves in Engineers Ireland Cork Region and our colleagues in the Institute of uh, Structural Engineers, ISTRUCT-D. Um, so we're delighted to have a presentation on uh, a project that has both uh, international and uh, local reach. Um, so uh, Paul Leahy of the School of Engineering and Architecture uh, in UCC is going to talk about the Rewind project, which is an international project looking at the uh, recycling and repurposing of wind turbines. And then his colleague, Kieran Rowan from the uh, Department of Civil and Structural and Environmental Engineering in MTU is going to talk about a local project where called the, the Blade Bridge project, where uh, turbine blades are being repurposed as uh, structural members in uh, bridges. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Paul, who's going to speak first. Thank you very, thank you very much, much Ronan, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to Engineers Ireland and ISTRUCT-D as well for the opportunity to present this work to you. Um, we're, uh, it's product of a very broad collaboration across many disciplines, uh, engineering through to geography, sociology, uh, architecture, and across uh, three different countries. So we have Ireland with UCC and MTU, uh, Northern Ireland, Queen's University, Belfast, and we have Georgia Tech as well involved in the Reban project. It was funded by a US Ireland award from SFI, Science Foundation Ireland, Department of the Economy in Northern Ireland, and also the National Science Foundation in the U.S. This is an overview of my part of the presentation, so I'll present part one uh, on the background of the Rewind project, and then I'll hand over to Kieran, and he'll present the Blade Bridge project uh, later on. So I want to give a little bit of a background on wind energy in Ireland, where it's come from, where it's going to, particularly with the context of the wind farm life cycle. What happens to wind farms when they're decommissioned? And more particularly, what happens to the blades when they're decommissioned? I'll give a little bit of the, the background to the Weeman project, where it came from, and the various transdisciplinary methods that we use to try to attack this difficult problem of what to do with wind turbine blades, which are have a complex geometry, complex structure, and also they have a complex material because they're composite uh, material, not easily recycled. Then I'll move and show some ideas about how blades can be repurposed, which have emerged from the Rewind project. We look at particularly opportunities on the developing Greenway network in Ireland. And then I look at some of our work briefly on integrated assessments, how we've looked at repurposing from an environmental, social, economic and technical point of view altogether to see are these solutions really viable in all these different senses. Next slide, please. So the background you can see in the top panel here that runs from 19, uh, 1980 through to 2030, you can see the, the huge growth in, in the deployment of wind energy in Ireland. So we've moved uh, to a situation where we have now on the island, we've about uh, 6,000 megawatts of de deployed uh, wind energy. If you think that the typical modern wind turbine is around three megawatts, you know, we're, we're, talk we're talking about 2,000 turbines. Each turbine typically has three blades. So you're talking about 6,000 blades on the island of Ireland. And you can see if you look at the 2030 bar there that that's going to grow even more by in the next decade. So you can see the growth from 153 megawatts to, to 5,576 in 2020, and almost we'll have uh, 10 gigawatts or nine, uh, 10,000 megawatts by 2030. Bear in mind that the typical turbine design lifetime is 20 years, although many are continuing longer than that. That means that if you look at the growth from between 2000 and 2010 on the panel there, you'll see that all that generation of wind turbines are now coming close to their decommission. This it gives you an overview of the typical life cycle of a wind farm uh, with an emphasis on the end of life. So we move from the left of the screen here where we have you know, the build and develop phase. Operational phase, of course, is the longest phase. Uh, so 20 plus years and many wind farms are go for 25 or 30 years. But at some point there will be a decision point reached where the operator has to decide, do they uh, continue to operate? Um, and that's known as lifetime extension in the build in the business. So you may be able to continue for another five or maybe even 10 years. And of course, you can continue to evaluate that decision. Do you go to the top of the screen, which is repower? And repower the site means that you uh, 
replace the turbines. So you keep the wind farm in operation, but you replace the turbines, which means, of course, that you're going to be decommissioning the existing turbines. Or you may move to the right, which is a pure decommissioning decision. And either of those two options, repower or decommission, mean that these wind turbines and their blades, these GFRP, glass fiber reinforced polymer blades, will enter the end of life phase. And what do you do with them? Well, there's a whole series of options that you can see on the right here. You can sell them on. There's a second hand market. You can repurpose them and turn them into new products. You can try to downcycle them and recover the materials. Um, so there is some value in the GFRP. Uh, you can try to recover energy and materials in cement kilns. You can go for a pure waste to energy approach and try to recover some of the energy. And then moving further down, you get into incineration and landfill, which are environmentally the least preferable solution methods. Next slide, please. So the kind of decision factors that we have here are things like uh, the end of design life, maybe the planning permission for the site expires, uh, the market, the electricity market may change or the subsidies may expire. And then there comes a point very often as with any system where operating costs begin to increase and the cost of repair and obsolescence comes into play. And those influence the decision on when the end of life point occurs. Next slide, please. So this is a circular economy challenge, what to do with these blades. They are made of, of GF, GFRP for the most part, so glass fiber reinforced polymer. It's a composite material. It's, it's very difficult to uh, recycle this and it's very difficult to disaggregate the two elements of the composite matrix. And the problem is growing as we saw already. So annually we expect to reach 40 million tons by 2050. And the current solutions that are used, incineration, stockpiling, landfilling, or maybe at best grinding up for aggregates, these are all at the bottom of the, the list that I showed in the previous slide. We would like to move up that list and we would like to find environmentally, what we hope are environmentally superior solutions such as repurposing. Next slide, please. So this is the volume of waste um, in, in Ireland um, and landfill uh, will no lo soon no, no longer be an option for end of life base in Ireland. Already um, there's a reticence to um, on behalf of landfill operators and also on the decommissioning agents to um, put blades into landfill. Wind Europe, the industry association in Europe have said that they want to an industry wide landfill ban in Europe by 2025. So this option will no longer be an option. We need to look at more sustainable solutions for end of life blades. Next slide, please. And this is where the transdisciplinary approach comes in. And I would like to just try to describe this. You know, when we started the initial talks about the Rewind project, which actually goes back to 2016, when the American and Northern Ireland partners approached us to join, uh, you know, we realized very quickly that this certainly wasn't going to be something that engineers alone could solve and that we would have to build a team that uh, incorporated many disciplines and where they would genuinely have to try to understand each other and work together in order to come up with a truly optimal way to deal with this uh, issue. So we need environmental, social, economically and technically sustainable repurposing solutions. So to do this, we have a team which involves engineers and UCC, um, my colleagues, Niall Dunphy in the Cleaner Production Promotion Unit and Jared Mullally in Sociology. And then we have uh, a great set of postdocs and PhD students who, who are drawn from very you know, different backgrounds, which we've assembled. The wider Riemann team as well, you know, brings in geographers, architects, as well as structural engineers and composites experts. So we have a very, very uh, broad expertise in the Riemann project, which I think has helped us to try to tackle this problem. Next slide, please. So I want to return again to this idea of a, a hierarchy of waste. So the green triangle that you see at the top right there is from the US Environmental Protection Agency. And that is from the top, their most preferred options for dealing with waste to the bottom, their least preferred. And at the moment, the conventional approaches to dealing with composite waste and wind turbine blades in particular are generally towards the bottom of this inverted pyramid. We're talking about disposal in landfill, uh, incineration, maybe it's energy recovery uh, and we want to move up that move up to the top of the of the pyramid they're non-biodegradable of course um and the other thing that you know gets forgotten sometimes is you know these are highly engineered 
products. Um, they have unique structural properties. They also have unique geometric properties, and they have a beautiful shape, which is you know aesthetically very attractive. But as Kieran will show later on in his presentation, that presents some unique challenges as well when it comes to putting them into a new use. They've, they've been very, very highly engineered and designed for their current life, but how do we exploit those properties in their second life uh, without running into problems? All the while respecting this idea of having economic, not just technically feasible, but economically, environmentally, and socially feasible repurposing. Next slide, please. And just by way of context, this was in the news this year. I just wanted to show a picture. Um, this is not directly to do with blades, but this is, shows what happens to uh, composite materials. And these are composites, really. Um, this is a clothing dump in, in Ghana. It's where a lot of Europe's um, disposable garments end up. So they, they go to markets and uh, aggregators in Ghana, and then what can't be resold, um, basically repurposed or resold, are recycled ends up in these landfills. You know, the, a lot of these are synthetic or mixes of synthetic and natural materials. So uh, this problem of just uh, you know producing without thinking about the end of life is leading to you know very very significant environmental problems around the world. Blades, of course, are not on the same scale in terms of volume as clothing, but they represent a similar type of problem. Next slide, please. So I'd like now to introduce the Rewind project. Uh, the goal of Rewind is to drive innovation in the reuse of decommissioned wind turbine blades. The organization of the project is that we have four kind of thematic areas, which we refer to as the thrusts. There's a wind energy thrust, which really is a, a circular economy thrust. And most of that work is done in the UCC. We have a mechanical thrust, most of which is done in Belfast and Georgia Tech. We have design, which is also done in Georgia Tech and Belfast, and more recently in, in MTU. And then we have geographical information science thrust as well, analyzing where blade waste is going to arise in the future. And that's run out of Belfast. Next slide, please. So when you see what we're focusing on is the environmental sustainability, the social acceptability, and sustainable business models for looking at these repurposed second and third life applications. And this in itself is also a complex multifactorial problem. Some of the work that we've done, which we'll show in a while, it has been informed by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide, please. So this just gives a little snapshot of some of the work that, that has been done to date uh, by the partners. When we, when we first met and first started working in Rewind, we had a kind of a brainstorming exercise where we came up with a large number of repurposing concepts. And um, the, um, we then ran a design office exercise, which whittled us down into a smaller number um, where these were selected for a kind of detailed development. So the success of those reuse cases, again, dep depends, of course, first and foremost on technical feasibility, which had to be demonstrated, but it also required a lot of other inputs. So the development of a geo database in all Ireland, all Ireland, covering availability of blade waste and end of life blades, 3D LIDAR scanning technology, which was used in Belfast for scanning some sample blades, uh, a software reconstruction tool, which can reconstruct the blade geometry from LIDAR scans, which was developed in Georgia Tech. And then of course, a whole battery of structural analysis, community engagement methods, which were developed in UCC, LCA, so life cycle analysis and integrated uh, success indicators. Next slide, please. So now uh, this is just a sample of some of the work that's been done in Belfast on what they call the GIS dashboard. So this is a, a very rich uh, geo database, which basically has a, a geolocation of every blade in Ireland uh, available in it. Not only that, it has the meta, really valuable metadata, such as the turbine model, the length of the blade, uh, the date it was uh, installed, and a projected date of decommissioning. So the beauty of this tool is that it allows the team to estimate where and when the blade waste will become available. And the where is actually very, very important because, you know, as we all know, moving large items like wind turbine blades around is expensive, it's logistically challenging, and for us in Rewind, it's important as well because it adds to the 
the carbon and energy footprint of any second life application. Next slide, please. And just as a sample, this kind of heat map here just shows where the, you know, the future uh, blade waste material is likely to come. And you can see the hotspots in the West Coast and in the Northwest where the wind farm, the generations of wind farms, which came in the, you know, in the 2000s will enter decommissioning in the future. Next slide, please. So now to move to some second life applications, some use cases for repurposed blades. I won't be going into any great detail on these. I just want to give a, an overview as an introduction to the second part of the talk. You see a couple of uh, early examples that uh, we uh, identified here. So uh, power distribution poles, um, these were developed in Georgia Tech uh, and temporary housing roofs and structural elements for tem temporary housing developed uh, in City University of New York, which is one of the founding partners of ReRent. Next slide, please. And I also just wanted to show uh, the, you can see in the foreground, the LiDAR uh, scanning unit. So these blades, uh, which you see here, will feature again later on in Kieran's talk. Uh, this is where they were, um, where we found them, which was with a company called Everon, who, who donated them to Rebind in Belfast. The Belfast team went and scanned these with 3D LiDAR scans, so we had an accurate uh, picture of the geometry. One of the problems with repurposing blades is that generally we don't have access to the original uh, geometry, so we don't have the, the detailed design from the original manufacturer. So we have to do quite a bit of uh, reverse engineering in order to not only get the geometric properties of the blades, but also try to calculate the structural properties. Next slide, please. This map here just shows the opportunity that we have for, um, in particular, for infrastructure and greenways. And, you know, there's expected to be 240 kilometres of greenways in Ireland in the Republic by 2022. And there are up to 1,000 kilometres of former transport routes in Northern Ireland suitable for greenways. And one of our PhD students, Angie Nagel, realised that there is an opportunity for uh, deployment of infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure on a sustainable transport network. Next slide, please. And following this kind of uh, realization uh, and looking at the, the, the rollout of greenways, one example came up, which was the, the old to Middleton Greenway in Cork. And then this really sparked um, the connection and the expansion of Rebin to uh, Kieran's team in MTU and, of course, Cork County Council as well. This is 23 kilometer route under development in East Cork, and it will open um, next year uh, in sections and a suitable location. It was surveyed and walked and a suitable location was found for a potential uh, bridge crossing, which could be constructed from decommissioned wind turbine blades. Next slide, please. So Part of the work that was done in UCC was looking at the, looking at the environmental impacts, so life cycle assessment. Um, what we chose as the functional unit was a consumption, or if you like, disposition of four and a half tons of blade waste and absorbing it for 60 years. So keeping it out of the waste cycle for 60 years, which could be the lifespan of a bridge. For this particular study, the blades were transported from Belfast to Cork, which is the actual blades that we're using on the East Cork uh, Bridge project. And this will displace some conventional materials. So some of the blades will displace steel girders. Uh, some will unfortunately end up in landfill if it's not possible to incorporate it in the bridge. There are some other materials, of course, there's additional concrete that's needed on site and epoxy and you know, some other materials. Uh, but these are the assumptions behind the environmental analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So when that numbers were run and we looked at the, the uh, relative environmental impacts of different end of life solutions for blades, uh, there is two options here, which you see as a downward or negative bars. So those are environmental impacts. The dark green are the bridge and the light green is co-processing. So putting blades into uh, cement kilns and using them as fuel and material for cement kiln. So that particular uh, solution is much lower down the waste hierarchy because it's not, um, it's, it's not preserving some of the original properties of the blades. And we can see that 
co-processing fares worse on all of these uh, four categories. So human health impacts, ecosystem impacts, climate change impacts, and resource impacts than using blades in a solution like a, a bridge where you repurpose them. Next slide, please. And another piece of work which was done and as it was done in uh, by our team and you see in Peter Dini of Polestock looked at this was uh, taking a, a multi-criteria decision analysis approach and looking at different uh, types of uh, solutions for end of life. So you see different colored bars on the right hand side here. In black, there's landfill, there's incineration in yellow. The co-processing in cement kilns is green. Transforming blades into furniture is blue and bridge fabrication in, in red. And these all have different costs and benefits in terms of environmental, social, and economic uh, uh, costs. Uh, furniture making, for example, has got quite a high benefit in terms of employment in local areas. But you can see the general trend here in all categories is that the, the repurposing applications, so furniture making and bridge fabrication, fares better than the, the conventional landfill and incineration routes. And whatever repurposing is done in the future, it has to be sustainable in terms of all those categories. Um, there's different types of values involved here, not just monetary values alone. Um, the values that in communities themselves have, where the blades are located and where the, the second life is likely to be, have to be considered in this. And this was also one of the things that Reven sought to do, was to try and find out, are people receptive to this type of um, activity in their community? And what do they, uh, what would they actually envisage for you know, the second life of these um, sometimes contentious pieces of infrastructure that they have already in their communities. So repurposing scores well um, on these integrated scores compared to conventional end of life disposal. Next slide, please. And in terms of greenways, you know, the greenway, we, we see that there is a big opportunity here. It's technically feasible and as Kieran will show later on, and the environmental analysis shows that it's also environmentally preferable to conventional solutions. Next slide, please. And now I'd like to quickly just cycle through four ideas from our design catalog. If uh, the QR code is properly visible at the bottom of the screen here, you can, you can scan it and you can, you can get a link to our catalog, which is compiled by uh, our colleagues in Georgia Tech. Some really, really nice renders of some really uh, interesting ideas for, for blades. I'd like to quickly go through four. So there's the bridge here, and in the next slide, you can just cycle through these actually, Kieran, just quickly. There's a blade pole, uh, which is the power distribution pole, or it can be used as a cell phone tower. There's a blade barrier, which is a noise barrier for highways or motorways, and then also a, sh a shelter. Which... So that uh, is me um, finished. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge all our um, uh, our colleagues in UCC, Queen's, George Tech and MTU, and of course everyone for donating the blades for the pilot project and our funders. And I'll hand over now to Kieran, who will take you into the details, the technical details. Okay, guys, I hope you can see my screen there. And uh, Paul did a very good job of outlining the scale of the project. And in my particular few notes here, I'll be talking about how we I suppose we, we, we were asked to help uh, advise the, the rewind team maybe two or three years ago, uh, just in terms of pedestrian bridges and um, uh, how you know, typical they say design, durability, lifespan, like, like that type of thing, and our involvement kind of mushroomed on from that point where uh, through liaison and, and uh, the Google of Cork County Council, uh, we were moving to a point where we're hoping to deploy, or we're about to deploy a, a play bridge out on the Middleton Yaw Greenway in January. And in this, these slides here, I'll explain uh, a little bit more information about what the material, uh, uh, FRP material is all about, um, the challenges we have with kind of trying to we are uh, to, to, to backwards engineer it, reverse engineer it, and uh, the testing we did in, in MTU and the structures of Archer over the space, space later nine months, uh, to the point where we currently are now down in uh, Fabrication Yard, Brownlow's Fabrication Yard in Cargoline. Uh, starting to put the bridge together. So I, I don't have complete but, uh, finished photographs of the bridge. Uh, we're at a certain early stage now in fabrication, but uh, you'll see lots of montages and different ideas on there. Okay, so uh, Paul has alluded to this a few times in his notes. The, 
The wind blade is a complex item. Uh, its geometry changes continuously along its length and it twists as well to get the aerofile uh, shape and the best, the best shape for, for generating or uh, I suppose power out of it. Um, but in general, on the left hand side up the top here, there's a, there's a circular cross section at the end called the root. And the root basically is uh, kind of, it's where the, obviously where the blade is attached to the turbine itself. And then as you move uh, from the left to the right, you're moving, moving into the, the aerofoil cross sections, uh, which is also designed to get the, the maximum lift on the blade, et cetera, et cetera. And if you take a cross section through the blade, uh, generally speaking, the part of the blade that's, that's uh, leading into the wind is called the leading edge. And the bit that's falling behind is the trailing edge. Uh, from a structural point of view, uh, the blade is made out of a, an FRP fiber reinforced plastic shell. Uh, and it's, it's, that shell is kind of strengthened in that zone there called the spar cap. Uh, where the material is thickened and the shear webs added. And that's particularly of interest to us as engineers, you know, starting to consider how we could use these blades uh, as bridge beams, let's say, you know. So just a quick few notes on, on fiber reinforced polymers. And I've taken these notes from uh, the, the, an excellent course from my, by uh, TU Delft on uh, FRB design construction engineers, which I recently completed and they passed us to advertise the course. So I thought by using their notes, I would do a little bit of that. Um, so fiber reinforced polymers, right? It's composite material. Uh, it's comprised of fibers, which have the load bearing function. And those fibers are then contained within a resin matrix. And the matrix um, at the resin basically has the function of fixing the fibers in a certain direction, uh, transferring the force between the fibers, preventing buckling of the fibers, and also protecting the fibers from degradation through moisture, environment, heat, etc. Now, uh, the, the fibers are tiny, they're grouped into uh, they're so mostly referred to as filaments, and they're, they're mostly put into rovings. They can be bundled together and into fiber mats, and those fiber mats can be made into fabrics. And the, fiber, the fabrics can really be uh, have it uh, have have the uh, the fibers located uh, in a defined direction, unidirection, or in a bidirectional uh, location, right? And the fibers are strong. Like in the question is often raised, like how strong is FRP? And if you see the the, the lower gray curve here, it's mild steel, maybe say to green universal beam. Uh, or pre-stress pre steel, you'll see that there's the most typical high-strength steels that we use, uh, and you'll see that the the uh, the fibers tend to be uh, have a, a higher strength and higher stiffness. But uh, you know you, you'll notice here as well that they they they, 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 there's, they don't have ductile behavior, and that's obviously a, of interest to us as engineers. Now the resin that we're going to encase these fibers in. Is a bit more ductile, and when you combine the two materials together, you improve, you, you you get some degree of ductility. Uh, the resins themselves are usually polyesters, vinyl esters, or epoxies. So, how do you actually combine the fibers and resins? And we combine them into to plies. You know, so you've got the uh, you, you know the the, the fibers which might be unidirectional or bidirectional. They're laid down. They might be uh, you know uh, encased in the resins. If you pluck them out of the top, put in a second, but in the end, you're left with a laminate. Uh, and the laminate is the, the series of plies with the fibers running in different directions, depending on your design requirements. And so like if you had an element that would say it's primarily subject to axial load, you might have uh, predominant fibers located in, in the, what we call the zero degree direction along the longitudinal axis. If you had an element that was maybe subject to a lot of shear loading, you might have lots of plus minus 45 degree uh, plies, you know, so that, that's broadly speaking how the system works. And it's a, a very tailored material. You could compare it to concrete in some respects that you know we can we can make concrete structure of any shape and size depending on our imagination and our design capabilities and whatnot. For FRP, it's a question of just selecting the fibers in the resin, uh, or we take those fibers in the correct direction that you're interested in, selecting the amount of fibers, and then the production process. And production processes typically you've got hand layups where you're kind of laying down the, the plies and you're rolling on uh, the resin that's, that's going to build up the material by hand like that. Or you can, there's a uh, manufacturing process like by protrusion, we're protruding the sections and uh, protruded fiber or uh, FRP uh, uh, sections are very commonly available these days. A number of manufacturers like Fiberline, et cetera. And you can you know, buy them like you buy, buy a normal steel section, I suppose. And you've got uh, down here in the left hand corner, you've got uh, vacuum infusion. And on the right hand side here, you've got filament winding. So these are broadly the, uh, uh, the, the, the structural. Are the the the, the metals manufacturer, I suppose, and uh, you know just do a quick bit of research there. You know the, the most modern turbine blades tend to be uh, con constructed on one piece, 
And there's a note there on the website of Siemens that their longest day is 80, 90 meters constructed one piece. Now, our problem as structural engineers is that, I suppose we're used to going to our tables of universal beams, uh, selecting the beam we want, we've got all the properties, our Zs and our Is and our Js, everything we need, similarly with pre stressed beams. Our problem here is that we're hoping to take a, a turbine blade. We really know nothing about it because uh, the manufacturers of the blade aren't, you know, it's, they, they, aren't, they don't regularly hand out any information about the blade. So we're into a process of reverse engineering. And uh, the reverse engineering is, is complex uh, and time consuming. And uh, I suppose that, that's really what we've been asked in NTU for the past year is doing all the testing to figure out what, 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 what are the blades made of, what's the geometry, what's the internal geometry, uh, and doing various testing damage at one second. So the type of things that we need to find out uh, for engineering design purposes, we also need the external geometry. And these days, I suppose we're looking at a lot of laser scanning as it become very cost effective. So we're relying heavily on laser scanning. And you'll see in the development of the, the bridge for Middleton uh, that laser scanning was done three or four times along the, the journey from uh, you know, the, the blades stored in the yard in Belfast before they're, 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 where they are currently deployed on cargo line in the fabrication yard. Trying to figure out the internal geometry, which really means trying to locate the spar caps, the webs, measure thicknesses, find out where any sandwich material is, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the material types, you know, what kind of fibers you have, what kind of resins you have, the laminates, et cetera, et cetera. And you're trying to measure, uh, you know, what percentage of fibers are in the resin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, strength and stiffness in the longitudinal and transverse directions. And FRP, typically uh, the material is, has two strong directions. Or it could be stronger in one direction versus the other direction, a bit like timber perhaps. Uh, so trying to figure out the stiffness in two directions, that's quite important for obviously the, the uh, strength calculations. And then the global blade structural properties along them, like I mentioned basically EI in the X direction, EI in the Y direction, G and J, torsion and, and shear moduli and all that type thing, again, varying in two directions. Oh, there is a lot of design guidance available uh, for the design of FRP structures and uh, this document here, the GRC document on 2016 and update 2017 is has a lot of very detailed information that's what we've been using primarily for design purposes. Uh, but there's a Syria guide as well from recent years. And as recently as eight or nine months ago, uh, a draft CN technical specification for FRP design was published. And that really is uh, a forerunner to a, a Euro code for FRP design, uh, which is likely to be published in the next round of updates to the structure Euro codes, uh, which is probably 2025 or thereabouts. So there's plenty of information to design uh, the, the, uh, the, the material is trying to go backwards and figure out what the material is made of and you don't know what it's made of essentially. So uh, Paul mentioned already the Middleton Wall Green Edge, 23 kilometers. Uh, Cork County Council, in fairness, have been superb to us, just allowing us to pitch the idea of, of, of deploying a, a blade bridge onto the Greenway. Um, you know, they, we walked the site, we came up with, we looked at various options and we decided to, to uh, that we want to locate the, the, FRP, the, the blade bridge at this particular structure here. It's an old railway bridge. And the deck obviously is falling over time. We're left with water and beams there. And it's, uh, at a, it's a flood relief channel, essentially, for the Dunkorner River. Uh, so I'm sure on a day like today, there's plenty of water here. Uh, a lot of the time, it's, it's dry. And we'll have some general cross-sections of the, the or some general uh, dimensional details in a second. But that's just a view of the, of the Greenway from earlier in the year. And I have this, uh, a short video here, um, just so you can see the, the bridge of opens there, uh, good solid opens, uh, 750 tick with some engineering block on the top. Down to the other side, so you know, you, you can see where the engineering brick is, but below that, good solid opens, and there's a temporary hall road in place at the moment uh, on site. Right, so general broad, like if you did this is a kind of plan view, this was a detailed survey of the existing bridge. Span is about five meters, the width is three to four meters, uh, the skew is about 18 degrees. And maybe the original plan back in a year ago was maybe look at like, redecking the bridge, kind of common to use these inverted T beams, uh, solid slab infill decks, uh, and just cap off the abutments with a, a, a 
uh, kind of bearing plant, plant to take the um, to take the, the nuclear stack. So the original concepts and these were developed by uh, Zoe Zhang, a student and uh, part of the Riemann team in George Tech. And Zoe actually came over to work with us in MTU for five months earlier this year. Uh, this kind of idea, just take the you know the, well, take the, the deepest part of the blade and uh, use that that kind of concept with deck then spanning between the two blades. And there's further concept designs there. Uh, or even you know, photo montages as uh, the as built or as proposed. Then over time, with our say discussions with Cork County Council and uh, you know developing the, the idea further, it was felt that you know aesthetically and uh, you know trying to tell the, the as the general public that this was a, a turbine blade in the past, uh, it might be nice to see the whole blade. So the design has been progressing probably since mid year based on the whole blade design. And the whole blade actually would project beyond uh, the back of the bridge like a little bit, so that as you approach from uh, one side, you'll see the fixings that normally went to the turbine, just to make it a, a feature, a feature of interest. Now, wind blade alignment, this really is our biggest problem. Uh, you know, it has been our biggest problem to date, uh, working with the geometry of the blade, and uh, just you get a feel there that, you know, it it the blade kind of there's a twist in the blade. Uh, so you know, every if you take a cross section every hundred millimeters, it's a different cross section uh, once you move away from the root, and that also has to be allowed for in our design. So laser scanning, big part of our project. So this, is, as Paul mentioned, was laser scanning of the blades up in the yard in Belfast before they came down. This then is the blades arriving into our structures yard in uh, MTU last last December a year ago, a day not unlike today in some respects. Um, you now the blades, you can see just in the background there, we have a few blades in the yard. Uh, you know, they've also been sitting in the yard that fast for many years. Uh, the, the, the blades have got a bit of hard work and a bit of elbow grease actually do scrub up very well. Uh, in the college, we were just a bit trepidatious. We'd never really worked with uh, FRP materials before. And we had a few video seminars with our colleagues in Georgia Tech, just with uh, expertise on how to cut the blades. And it turns out the blades are actually extremely easy to work with. Uh, and it's, you know they, they cut very simply with uh, consoles and whatnot. And this is a general cross section through the blade. Um, this is the, the spar spar cap area, or spar box area, and you can see the webs here. And that's that's the strongest part of the blade, and that's the part that we want to tap into uh, just for for, for I think so, say an edge beam, let's say. And you can see the thickness of the, the lamina started varies as you go around. And occasionally as well, it's by four kids, it's into two, and it's a sandwich filler material. That just gives an increased sectional properties in that section of the, of the, the, the blade up the top there. So that's the general cross section through the blade there. Now that, that cable going through there is like the older generation blades had a kind of a movable tip to help with control and whatnot. So that's an old control cable that's going through the blade. So we cut the blade, we, we added a few blades to work with. So one blade, blade became a sacrificial blade in some respects. To be cut into pieces and, and scanned. And this is Barry from HD Surveys, who kindly did further laser scans of parts of the blade uh, to get more, more geometrical information. And then you're basically trying to really from those scans, internal and external scans, putting a full three dimensional model of the uh, blade together. Right. And then the question of moving on like, you know, again, we don't know anything about these blades. We don't know exactly what the fiber percentage, the type of fiber is all that kind of stuff. We don't know that they are very glass fiber, et cetera, but we don't know the fiber content. Um, so we spent several months in the structural laboratory in MTU doing static load tests, uh, connection testing, uh, uh, FRP burnout tests, which is your tests which allow you to figure out what the, 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 what's the volume fraction of fibers uh, and what kind of laminates you have, or what kind of plies you have present and what direction the fibers are generally going in. And so we'll have a look at some of these. Um, so this is our heavy structures rig in, in MTU. We cut out a kind of section of the blade. Uh, you know, we have to, have to actually cut away. But we, we know we're going to be using this part of the blade for, for, for the main bridge. Uh, so this bit, we're, we knew we were testing a slightly lighter part of the blade, which would be good information in any case. We know that the other blade parts would be stronger. It's a, what, what you might call a four-point bending test. And we're trying to create a nice bending moment so the video I'm going to show you is about it's about 55 seconds long, right? And uh, you will see the blade being tested to failure, and you, audio you you hear the, the the hydraulic system working hard and all this, but as it's putting the load on, 
uh, the blade fails at about 90 ton. Uh, so, you know, it's significant enough kind of a, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, that, that load on it. Um, uh, and then towards the end, you'll see that there is a sudden failure uh, in the section. Top yeah. Yeah. As you would seem to start the last few minutes of the, the first seconds of the clip there, that there was a sudden drop. And um, what was happening then was that uh, that was a point where the internal, uh, the shear web, which is a kind of a, a kind of C section tone stands on it, had separated from the side of the blade. And uh, there was also some cracking of the blade just at the support areas, really. And that was the, the nature of the failure. You know, when we take the blade out of the rig then, it's a question of just cutting it up and trying to trace the damage. And, you know, taking the 100 mil sections and, and just tracing the damage and seeing exactly where the blade had failed. And generally, it's in the support areas. It was in the support areas. And I, I actually mentioned 90 ton, I meant to say 90 kilograms. And so about 9 ton. Um, is where it failed, and then you would start to unusual behavior because the blade was then sort of in two different parts. Uh, but generally, it's a linear, not a huge amount of ductility. Uh, failure by separation is always going to be maybe a sort of a brittle failure in some respects, uh, but at, at a load about nine ton. Then when we on to connection tests, we did a series of connection tests, uh, we know we've got to connect a deck into the side of the blade. Uh, it, 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 the, for this particular bridge, we opted to use uh, steel connections and steel beams or steel cross members into the side of the structure. You could use pull through the sections, um, but maybe that's in a future, future iteration. Um, so we stuck with steel and a series of, of test connections. And what we're doing here basically is we have a typical bracket and we have two 12 mil bolts and we're loading directly uh, on top of the bracket. Uh, we're looking at, let's say, everyday bolts, which are great 8 8 bolts. Uh, then we're looking at blind bolts, and blind bolts are a kind of a proprietary system. Uh, they're kind of a bolt which can be which can be used. Let's say if you're trying to attach something to a hollow box section, and you can't access the inside of the hollow box section, uh, a blind bolt is a type of device that allows you to do that. And you also look to put in 12 mil diameter threaded bar uh, through the section. And like this is us post post test. Very little damage to the, this is up going through the, the, the downstand from this web above our heads here, and the downstand in the kind of spare, spare cap area, and practically no damage at all uh, to the blade. Uh, this is just passing through the, the, the rods, the, the tie rods, uh, the, uh, the thread bar. And in, in that case, we, you know, that was going through the, 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 the shell area away from the ticking section of the, of the, the downstand of the web bar. And we get a little bit of bearing failure. Through the, through the material, but in class traffic, and you get a lot of, in this case, we got deformation of the bar as well. And these then are the blind bolts, and the blind bolts, again, they, these are allowing you to fix onto one side, but on you, when you don't want it access. And what we were finding with addition settlement, settlement, settling in the connection, very good behavior. And we were getting about 50 kilonewton or five ton on, on that connection. And, uh, you know, basically, it, it, Failure was due to maybe the displacement starting to occur at that point, so we just cut off your left residual displacement that infection. And these are the blind bolts then after the tests. And you can see a little bit of deformation of the shank of the bolt. Um, and the, uh, I should put a little photograph there, but the, 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 uh, the blade side itself uh, had no damage on it at all. And then you've got GFRP burnout tests. And this is, we did, we did many, many of these. And when our, our, our colleague Zoe Zhang was over from George Tech with us at the start of the year, 
she does an awful lot of these tests. And this is a standardized test actually, it's an ASTM procedure for it. You take out a, you cut out a token or a sample of the blade material. Uh, you don't you see the purpose of the test really is to find out uh, what kind of fibers do you have, what's the percentage of fibers, etc. So you cut out your token, it goes into a hot oven about 600 degrees Celsius for about an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, that burns off the resin. And then you're left with the stack of uh, plies and you can peel them apart and you can actually weigh uh, and do volumetric calculations to see what, what's the percentage of, of fiber volume in your overall token. And you can also uh, differentiate between the different different uh, plies. Like there's a, a nice degree ply, there's a unidirectional ply, there's a, a 45 degree ply. And these these we feed directly into our design calculations. Uh, so we, we build our final models. Most final element programs these days have a composite tool, which allows you to uh, add in your, your laminate, your plies, and the following overall laminate, and it'll help calculate out the various material characteristics. So the burnout test is a very important uh, part of the process of reverse engineering, because uh, it gives us great information on, on the material itself. And then we're constructing models. I just took these from uh, Dr. Russell Gentry in Georgia Tech, and these are LS Dyna FEA models. And we're building models similar to this ourselves using LUSAS, which is our regular FE program to be using in the department. And that allows us to model composites as well. But you can see, you know, the, 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 the various ply thicknesses are modeled individually. And, and that's, this is how we, we look at, uh, you know, pushing the blade or examining the behavior of the blade beyond the point. Uh, say, after the, say we're, we're capped out a certain amount of load we can put on the section in the laboratory especially the ticker sections are using flat element so, so that you can push beyond what the lab can give us and uh, we can really start examining the structure. And then we're into design development and I suppose doing the number crunching on, on the structure and uh, you know so moving on from direct uh, topographical surveys uh, uh, you know orientating the blades uh, figuring out how the blades will be held in place and uh, etc etc and just some design drawings and again some of the details the, that's the general plan view of the structure. The structure is skewed. It's also falling from uh, right to left and from north to south. You know, so it's, you know, we, we probably made life a bit difficult for ourselves by selecting a skew bridge and a bridge which is falling in two directions. Uh, the general cross section is, is this. You've got the blades. You've got a, a connection into the spar cap area. And you've got a steel deck, steel deck plate and uh, an epoxy resin finish. And one of the geometric features of the bridge, which I'll talk about in a second, is you know, trying to hold the blades in place at the right tilt and at the right level. And you've got four different leveling points. It's very, very complicated. So the design solution we came up with was uh, designed for these kind of what we call we call them cradle, cradles. They're kind of steel cradles. They're, they're uh, so it's just three pieces of steel welded together with the, on the base plate. And, there's hole drills at the, drilled at the right angle, at the right location. There's also holes correctly uh, set out on the blade side. And we have two tread bars, which we pass through, and that fixes the blade tilt. And then we can fix the, the level of the base of the, of the anchorage as well, the cradle, uh, to get us set up properly. And that, that, that's kind of key to getting our geometry set out. The connection of the members uh, directly into the into the blade itself is by uh, a kind of a gusset plate type connection, and uh, you know we, we noticed that we, you know, we were, our point of failure at, at very large loads was the separation of the of the the, the, the web downstand and the blade itself. So some of these blades act serve not only just for holding the connection onto the onto the blade itself, but also holding or tying uh, preventing any failure that could occur between those two plates at some point in the future. Setting out, right, it really just nearly broke our hearts because, again, the geometry is curving in two directions. Uh, but thank Dennis Cronin for doing an awful lot of work in this, getting the geometry set out properly. So we knew we knew exactly what, what points we had to locate to make sure we were hitting the right part of the plate with that of plate Santa. That was grand in theory, but uh, on the yard, trying to, trying to set things out, it was proving just quite difficult to set things out. And in the end, uh, HD surveys came in and uh, set things out for us because we needed that kind of level of dimensional control uh, to set us out. You know, you can see the four cradle plates here and the tread bars, which allows us to fix everything in space. 
carpets, not carpets, so we're still talking about carpets actually with the council and uh, Cochrane Council and, and the landscape architects for the overall greenway have developed some concepts for carpets. Uh, this is one that we're looking at at the moment. That's uh, the landscape architects, Paul Hogarth company. Uh, but just construction sequence, like basically the process is to, to I suppose, uh, you saw the abutments uh, at the earlier stage of the top there. So those abutments have to be, uh, I suppose, tied up, cleaned off, strengthened, and just repaired, and all the rest of it. And they're in really good condition at the moment. Uh, we have to do a, a concrete sill. Uh, then we'll be installing our, our cradle plates. Where these clay bars are shown at the moment. They'll be slided out, let the plate drop in, and they'll be slided back in to hold the blade in position. Then we're we've dro dropping the base in place. There's reinforcements to be added. To, Create these upstart plinths and encase the tread bars. This question adding the steelwork then and the deck and the parapets. Again, parapets yet to be finalized, but it may be something like this. And uh, then there's an epoxy resin, I'd say bridge master, anti skid surfacing type of uh, surface to the plate, and that'll tie in then with the greenway itself. So this is where we are at the moment. We're down in, in Brown Lows in Cargo Line. We should be shift, uh, I suppose, our operations from the structures yard in, in MTU. Uh, down to Cargo Line, we just didn't really have enough space in the college to, to start putting the bridge together. And uh, we probably needed a bit of expertise as well, just on the fabrication side. Um, you can see the blade, this is the blade. one of the blades arriving into the front. And the thing about this is that we, we took five, we, we took a, a series of blades in from everyone in Belfast. Uh, the three of them are in, worked with, um, in, the, in, the, in the yard and MTU, just, they're still there, causing annoyance to the rest of my colleagues, I'm not out. So but, um, we have blades stored uh, courtesy of Lemac as well up in Forge Hill. And so the blades we're using for the bridge are the best of blades we took down. Uh, this is after a morning scrubbing and polishing. Uh, myself and my colleague Angie Nagel just literally washing the blades by hand and scrubbing them, and they do, they do clean up very well. Then setting the blades out. So we did we did some initial setting out of blades to uh, at least get the anchorage plates, cradle plates set out in the right uh, plane and right space. And the numbers were just there was something quite not quite right with the numbers in uh, setting out wise. Uh, so we need to do a, another laser scan of these two blades. And what we found like these are first the blades that we're using at the moment are early generation wind blades, probably had a certain amount of hand layup manufacturing, and there was geometrical differences between the blades. Uh, so HD surveys came in back and they rescanned the base for us, uh, which required uh, our colleague Dennis Cronin to remodel the geometry uh, and get the things set out again. Uh, so this then is the blade in the yard at the moment, uh, or the blade, one of the blades, uh, set out on its anchorages at the at the right tilt, and we'll be adjusting. We'll be, we'll be the levels will be corrected then, uh, or are corrected at the moment by just uh, lifting. Uh, if that's zero, zero level on the right hand side, that has to be lifted about 115 millimeters on the left hand side to get the fall that's on the bridge, and similar on the blade that's on, on the, off the bridge or you're on the right hand side. So then you're trying to you know, manufacture or fabricate steel fabrication plates to suit the geometry of the, of the blade. And this again, you know, the blade is, is curving in two directions. Uh, so it, it requires a degree of expertise uh, from the, the, the skilled fabricators in brown lows and they had the equipment and various heavy duty presses and whatnot and you know we're achieving like this is just a try fit out there with, with tack welding onto the uh the receiving plate um so like we're, we're getting good success at the moment just preparing these fabrication details and fire fabrication is progressing to the point now where we'd expect that we'll have the all the work fabricated and in place uh before we break for christmas Okay, so this is where we are at the moment. We're completing fabrication in December for Christmas. Uh, our steelwork has to go to the galvanizing plant in early January, back into the yard and cargo line then for assembly and load testing. Again, load testing with kind of sandbags, that type of thing. And then we're aiming to deploy the bridge in January 2022. I feel guilty now because I, I wish we were, uh, this talk was maybe in a month's time or two months' time, but that's where we are at the moment. And um, uh, just to conclude, uh, a few acknowledgements. I just want to particularly acknowledge uh, Cork County Council's help to us, uh, just a particular note of appreciation. I know they've been very accepting and putting up with us uh, on the project. Uh, Cormac Sulawan initially for, you know, being receptive to the idea, Claire Cronin, uh, the site team, Roy O'Shea, Will Downey and colleagues, John Conroy, Kevin Murray, much appreciated uh, for taking the drawings and geometric control of Dennis and Harry and HD surveys and Marius. The rewind 
Cork team is Paul, myself, Russell, and Larry from Georgia Tech, Angie from UCC, Zoe from Georgia Tech, and I'm Marius from Cunes, Queen's Radio University of Belfast. Jim, Liam, and Maggie are technicians in, in the structures of archery. And uh, the Rewind Principal Investigators are, are Larry, Russell, Paul, Jenny, and Gian. And I would really direct you to the Rewind uh, website, it's simply re-wind.info. Uh, it's a fantastic resource. It lists everything that's been done on the project for the past four years or more. And there's, there's a kind of mailing list there as well if you're interested in getting updates on the project. And certainly would encourage you to do that. So, you know, it, it, as Paul would like in his talk, there's been a fantastic amount of work done. So on that note, I'll conclude and hand back uh, to the chair. Very much, Karen. Um, absolutely excellent lecture, and I, I think you know, um, as I said at the start, uh, very interesting to have a view of of, of, of what is both a, a, a large international and you know a project with with, with a, a very interesting local um, focus as well. Um, so, uh, apologies, now I'm just going to uh, get the gallery view up there. Um, so folks, if you would like to ask some questions, and I have I have seen a few come in there, uh, you can use the Q&A function, uh, which is at the bottom of your screens. Um, I know, Paul, you've perhaps answered one or two, but I might just read them out again, just that um, I suppose everybody in the audience kind of gets the, 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 the benefit of it. Um, so I suppose the first one that had come in um, from Declan Whelan was, uh, he was just asking if you could explain a bit further about the, um, the concept of, of making furniture from the, the blades. Thanks, Ronan. I think my connection is unstable again, and uh, that, that's why I typed in the answers as well. Or you're back again. Right, that I might, my connection might drop. I, I'm not sure if people can hear me, but I'll just keep talking. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, the furniture making concept is interesting. Some other people have looked at this as well in uh, Germany and in Netherlands as well. So if you you can cut out some forms um, from the, the blade and reassemble them. Um, so they're nice exercises in kind of 3D geometry, but you can make picnic benches, small tables, loungers, recliners. Um, these typically can you know command quite a high value. There's a high labor input as well. So it means that there's you know lots of opportunities for rural development, local enterprise. Um, so we think it's quite a nice solution, especially from the social side uh, for repurposing. Um, I, I actually might ask a, a kind of a somewhat of a follow up question, um, I suppose, on, on perhaps the larger um, blades. Obviously, they, they, they kind of have a geometry and a kind of a continuous curve, but I, is there sufficient, um, I suppose, areas that you can cut out that are more or less flat? I mean, obviously, they're not flat, but for the purposes of constructing a, a, a piece of furniture which is relatively small compared to the the size of the blade. Um, can you get sections that are yeah somewhat? You need to choose your your section. That's that's the challenge really. Is you need to choose your sections carefully. Of course, you know the internal structure is, is relatively flat. So you know, when Kieran showed the, the cross sections there, you could see that the you know the shear webs and spar caps. You can use those as, as flat surfaces. Um, otherwise, you're looking at kind of adding you know materials onto them. So it, it's it's quite bespoke. Um, it probably would present a lot of challenges to kind of scale up um, as a business. So you'd probably be looking at kind of very high end products, um, high labor input, high design input, and, and high price probably as well. But on the other hand, potentially high kind of value for local economies. Um, and if I could again ask another question myself. Um, how 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 difficult is it to, to actually cut the material? I mean, just you know, is it something that can be done with a standard angle grinder, or are you talking specialist machinery? Um, I well, asked that one actually just after a, um, a year working with the material. It's very very easy to cut actually. And we're looking at standard console. Uh, you know, I can't remember the exact blade type we're using in the console now, but it's it really very easy to work with. Um, and you just wear you wear it a bit of it, like the, the, you know a bit of a mask around you because the fibers just are a bit loose around you and you get a bit of dust in your your hands and whatnot you know but it's, it's safe material easy to work with and um, very straightforward you know so no no particular special equipment required. Very good. Um, question there from uh, my colleague Miho. Um, 
Uh, I suppose the shape of the cross section of each blade is different, hence the reverse engineering, or there would be the possibility for repetitions. I suppose is it a case of if 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 you get the the reverse engineering of a particular model of blade, can you then kind of iterate on from that or? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it probably depends on the year the blades were produced, you know, in the early blades. And Paul might correct me on this now, the, the early blades, a certain amount of hand layup, you know, so that you're almost manufacturing by hand. Uh, the more modern blades are doing all, are more of an automated process and vacuum infusion and all that kind of thing, you know, with single molds, you know, so it may be the case that, um, you know, the more modern blades are easy to re re reuse in the future. But certainly, there was a, a you know a little a decent bit of geometry variance in the the five blades we've worked with so far about this past year and a few months. You know, uh, we have plus or minus 100 millimeters in the, the say the vertical direction, especially where the you're transitioning from the root uh, up into the the main section itself. Um, just in the chat there as well, we've a couple of questions. Um. Um, how is the stability in the horizontal direction uh, perpendicular to the girders at bridge uh, tested? Um, yeah. your... Well, you're 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 kind of relying on your final on the software to do your booking analysis and that type of thing for that for that testing. You know. Okay. Um, um, also in the chat there, Matt Clifford, have you checked in course of design what the equivalent, um, I suppose, girder size would have been required for the bridge? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, we're in the process of it, but we're, we're preparing a paper at the moment where we're just comparing um, the, the bridge we're proposing to use versus a kind of standard universal beam type bridge. And I haven't done the exercise yet, much to my colleague Angie's by annoyance, but we'll, we'll, we'll know by the end of the week, let's say, you know. Yeah. But you know ourselves, like we've the several bridges that just kind of scale the around the country anyway, you know. So, yeah. Um, another question Have you considered dropping the deck? Um, on the top of the spar, um, like the the attaching inside yeah. is is that an aesthetic thing or is there? Yeah, that's a good question as well because well you want to get into the spar box area let's say anyway you know but we could raise it higher but then you're actually you're losing the effect of so if you're trying to create a, a you know a, a situation where the, the user at bridge gets to you know see the blade and and it, it appreciate it's being reused or recycled or whatever that's why the bridge deck is probably set a little bit lower you know. Um, because when you see these blades in person, they're quite tactile. There's a nice smooth surface to them. So really, we're trying to utilize the the, the bridge, the, the blade size is almost the lower parts of the parapet, let's say. You know, but yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah that's a good, good question. I think um, there's a design in the catalog um, that has that type of um, configuration. I think, but you'll see that the you know the, the the deck sits very high on 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 the blade, and anyone walking across the deck won't won't really know that that there, there is a blade which is a valid option um definitely um uh, i suppose um, some part of a, a follow-on from my question about cutting but how, how durable is the blade to accidental vehicle damage or easy punctured or bent i suppose they're obviously quite strong in their own way but i, I suppose yes. a, a puncture Type, um... yeah, they're, they're, they're quite robust and in service they take a bit of punishment as well you know like from bird strikes and lightning and things like this and uh wind buffeting and whatnot um so reasonably robust I, I, it's a good question mark um, whether you know if a vehicle dri drives into anything to what extent you know it'll be damaged afterwards you know um you know, my own experience with the places that i would say that it would take the van quite well you know probably it would be damaged afterwards you know um Going back to the Q&A dialogue there, uh, Orno Keith, uh, who's a colleague of mine, um, how, how would the blades react to being utilised underwater or in a salt environment? Yeah, that's a very good question too. Thanks, Orn. Um, yeah, so you have to be quite careful with the blades. You know, like, so when you cut uh, the FR material and then you leave uh, an exposed edge where the fibres are exposed to the elements, then you can get moisture degradation, you know? So, for example, we're cutting holes to put bolt holes through. You've got to reseal the annulus uh, to prevent any moisture ingress. But they are quite sure once you once you once you're satisfied that you you're excluding moisture from the overall FRP, uh, uh, then they are quite robust. You know, so they and they are used. For example, uh, you just mentioned I spent the past few months kind of doing this course online with uh, TU Delft, and they they use the FRP generally for an awful lot of lock structures and. 
maritime marine structures like that, and they're heavily used and have been for many, many years. So once you're 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 not exposing frayed edges to water, you don't have a problem, you know. Um, and then we've, um, I think maybe the last two questions are both from Liam Duffy. Uh, I suspect you might have answered um, the, the the first one. Uh, given the variety and dimensions of the blade, um, you will, will you need to reverse engineer for each type of blade and size to establish their properties? And I suppose that's what you were saying about the, the newer the blades, they're more um, yeah. uniform in their in their in their construction. Um, and yeah. I suppose. The second question then, Liam, had uh, in terms of durability, what's the expected lifespan um, of the material? Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Liam. Yeah, uh, just in the first question there, like, the, yeah, there is this, that, so that is the challenge that there is a certain amount of reverse engineering. And the colleagues in Georgia Tech have developed software called the Blade Machine, which, which really, based on laser scans and other bits and pieces, can help put together a reverse engineered model uh, in terms of lifespan. Um, we've we don't see an issue with 50 years, and I know whether we get 120 years out of it, I don't know, to be honest. And I, 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 I can actually in more detail answer that because I wouldn't mind getting uh, our colleagues in Georgia Tech, uh, said Larry and Russell and Victor, would have a better handle on, on durability. But, but no media issues. Like once you can, once the, the structure remains uh, like undamaged, it is a very long lasting material, you know? Um. As always, I said last question, but there's one more. Uh, Ron McHale was uh, wondering, um, uh, have, have you looked at actually identifying the particular resin in the blades? And if so, um, how and does this then impact the design, the the, the engineering, the reuse? Yeah. So uh, in short answer, we haven't done the usual amount of work that on these blades. But uh, you know, when you're designing FRP as a new material, as a designer, uh, there are pluses and minuses to each of the types of resins that we use, you know, and uh, no, we're satisfied. Like in, in all cases, you're talking about a structure uh, which is already a design structure element taking significant forces. So usually it's not a big issue that we're worried about the wrong type of resin like that it might, might have been used, let's say, you know. Um... So look, folks, um, I think that was the, the last question, and I, I suppose we're, we're kind of at quarter past eight, so I might uh, bring bring the evening to a close. Um, so, you know, uh, Paul and Kieran, thank you very much for a very, very genuinely, very interesting lecture. Um, you know, I think uh, we, we, we had quite a good attendance, and, and I think the important thing is we had very good engagement in the Q&A, which is always a good sign of, 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 of an interesting lecture. Um, my, I'll tip my hat to both of you for, uh, I know we had some technical issues, but uh, you, you handled it like pros. You can tell that you're you're used to public speaking. Um, I was joking offline that we might get a, a job for Kieran in the Late Late Show, you know, kind of roll it in there, uh, yeah. uh, Roisin. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'll, 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 I'll finish up by, again, thanking you on behalf of Engineers Ireland Cork Region and the Institute of Structural Engineers who are co-hosting tonight on behalf of the attendees and the members. Um, and uh, look, we we hope to have you back again at some other point, either to, to talk about this project or maybe maybe again other aspects of the the the, the rewind project. Um, so I suppose in terms of Engineers Ireland Cork Region, we're finished up for. Uh, the Christmas break and we'll be back again in the new year so keep an eye on the Engineers Ireland website um, and likewise I'm sure uh, our colleagues in ISTRUCT have, uh, have some interesting events coming up so keep an eye on uh, their website and their social media as well uh, so folks without further ado uh, thank you and good night thanks everyone thank you Cheers.